Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for Worship Online. We want you to feel as much a part of the service as you would if you were sitting right here in the room with us. So we have someone in the comment section, they're monitoring that, ready to respond to messages. Would you take a second right now, would you post in there and let us know that you're watching? Maybe you wanna send in a prayer request or something to let us know how we can be praying for you. You can do that right now, because you're a part of this service too. And if you're joining us for the first time, or maybe you have a question like, how do I get baptized at North Monroe? Would you text Connect NM to the number on the screen? And that's going to send you a digital Connect card where you can fill out, give us your information, and a little bit more about maybe what your specific need is. And we would love to reach out to you and help you with that. Again, we're glad you're here with us. Let's worship now. Good morning, everybody. Join me in standing as we worship together. What a friend we had in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to
forgiven, Lord, that at the cross you defeated death, you defeated hell, you defeated sin. Lord, I pray that we would live uh, as the redeemed believers that we are, Lord, and that we would share that hope and salvation with this world, Lord, that we would continue to uh, just look to you and share your love with everyone that we would come into contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to say something about this song that we're going to sing. Uh, 2020 was a pretty tough year, and many of us lost uh, friends and loved ones, and uh, we lost our Brittany as well. So we're going to sing this song, and uh, it's Knowing What I Know About Heaven. <laughs> Bet the trumpets play and the angels sing every sweet refrain 
of amazing grace and that heaven's hands opened up the gate and the children danced when they saw your face as happy as they were to see you coming i was just as sad to have to watch you go oh
for your love, Lord. We thank you for uh, the cross and we thank you for heaven. Lord, we thank you that we have been saved because of your love for us. And we know that uh, when we die, we have eternity to look forward to. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to, uh, while we're in this world, share that hope and that light. In Jesus' name.
Good morning, North Monroe Online Campus. It's so good to be with you today. Today's obviously a different kind of day, and it feels a little different in here um, because we're having church in the parking lot, but I wanted to spend some time with you and sort of walk with you through the scriptures this morning um, so that uh, we would still be together. We so value you being with us every week, and we've got online folks from all over the place, and we're just glad you're here today uh, worshiping together with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for um, this time that we have together, and I pray that it would be useful for you and that you would challenge us to be the kind of people you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we really live in a crazy time. I read recently, this past Sunday being Mother's Day, that there were some people who wanted to change it from Mother's Day to Happy Birthing Person Day. And you're like, wait, what? Why would you you do that? Well, it goes back to this idea that people have today that gender is not biological, but it's a choice that everyone makes on their own. And so if you were born a biological female and you gave birth to children, then now you... uh, you identify as a male, then the word mother doesn't really seem to fit you anymore. And so we can't really call you mother. Um, So let's call you birthing person. (laughs) You know, it's insane. I I get it. And, you know, old dinosaurs like me who still believe that, uh, that gender is biological and that you can look at a little baby right away and you know that that little guy's either a little guy or he's a little gal. You know, he's a little boy, he's a little girl. You know, guys like me are, are, are on the outs now. We're called gender binaries, and um, we've been canceled. Uh, Babylon B did a funny piece on this kind of insanity. Uh, they said, non-menstruating partner wishes menstruating partner a happy birthing person day. <laughs> I love that. In the comments section of the bee said, may you bear many more offspring of indeterminate gender as is your primary function in this relationship between two or more homo sapiens. Look, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious. This politically correct idiocy is having a chilling effect on free thought, free speech, and free exercise of religion. Because if you don't toe the party line, you get canceled. And people are so afraid of being canceled in the cancel culture that they just won't speak out anymore. They won't say anything. And so all of a sudden, it just gets weirder and weirder. What do we make of this? Well, I mean, obviously, the world has lost its mind. Clearly, culture no longer takes its cues for, for its values and its morality from the church. We get that. But one of the things I think becomes evident is that our society is in serious trouble. And I don't know anybody that would disagree with that on any side of the political spectrum. We're in serious trouble. I mean, you've got families disintegrating. You have this, this that's if they get married at all. You have this staggering uh, statistic of, fam- of kids growing up in fatherless homes. You've got... Uh, runaway drug addiction and chemical abuse, you've got sexual abuse, you've got despair and depression and anxiety in numbers we've never seen before. And so the answer to it is, let's rename Mother's Day. I mean, come on. We're, We're clearly in trouble. And so the question then becomes, what do we do about it? I mean, as the church, as the body of Christ, how do we fix this world? I mean, do we need to set them straight? I'm all for speaking truth as long as you do it in love, you know. Uh, I don't think that's always the case, but a lot of guys think, well, what we need to do is we need to uh, set up some online dialogue or some blog or something like that and defend the truth, and, and somehow we're going to spend hours and hours confronting atheists with their wrong belief system, and that's going to, in, in some way, uh, change the world. Good luck with that. Do we need to protest more or boycott? You know, I'm all for fighting for what we believe, but does it really work? I mean, hasn't that been the strategy for the last 30 plus years? And it seems to me that if anything, it's only calcified the opposition and people have become more entrenched in their positions and more difficult to reach than ever before. So I've yet to meet anyone that was one to Christ through a protest. 
Um, so I think the question is, what did Jesus tell us to do? I mean, did he tell us to stand for truth? Or did he tell us to make disciples? Brant Hansen, in a great little book called Unoffendable, he said, Choosing to be unoffendable not only helps me sleep at night rather than worrying about my latest online, quote, stand for truth, it helps me remember that Jesus didn't even ask me to stand for truth on everything. He told his followers to go and make disciples, make other followers. Here's the build I summary of what Jesus told us to do. Love God, love people, share the gospel. That's it. Use your influence to bring people to Jesus. See, here's the thing. I can't change the world. And my online blog's not going to change the world. My argument with non-believers uh, uh, through social media is not going to change the world. My protests and my boycotts, they're not going to change the world. I can't change the world. But I can influence my friend for Jesus. And when Jesus gets a hold of my friend's life, my friend changes. And when my friend changes, he influences his friend's for Jesus, and they change. And when friends start influencing friends and friends get changed, then whole communities start to look different and they start to think different and they start to act different and they get changed. And when whole communities get changed, before you know it, guess what? The world has been changed. And that's really our calling. That was our strategy from the very beginning. But we can't do that alone. We have to do that together. And that's one of the big reasons why we're better together because together we have influence. And God designed us that way. He designed us to do this thing together. Um, and so let's start with this. Every single one of us is different. You, you knew that already, right? I mean, that, that's not rocket science. Throughout the New Testament, in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians, Paul compares us to the body of Christ. Now, when we read that, uh, those of us who have read it many times, we, we tend to just interpret that immediately as a description for the church. The church is the body, right? But, but back it up and realize what he's actually saying. You are the body of Christ. We together, corporately, collectively, represent Christ to this world. We are the physical representation of Jesus to our generation. But here's the thing. You can't represent Jesus on your own because a body has many moving parts, right? Right? So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and kind of flesh this out, see what it means. Beginning in verse 14, it says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. And so God has given each of us a role to play within the body. Some of us were designed differently, intentionally, and he has positioned us in the body exactly where he wants us. If you skip down to verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 12, it says, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. In other words, God designed you the way he wants you to be with certain inclinations, background, history, everything else. And he did that so that you would fit a very unique purpose within the body of Christ. Okay? Now here's the thing. Sometimes you can feel as if your place in the body is not important. You think, well, I'm not on the platform. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a minister. I'm not a life group leader. I'm not a missionary. Uh, there's nothing visible or, or uh, you know, obvious about my role in the body, and so I must not be as important. Keep reading 1 Corinthians 12. Let's go back up to verse 15. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. You know, funny thing about feet, you just don't think about them much until you're missing one or until there's something about your foot, it starts to hurt. You ever get a splinter in your big toe and every step reminds you of how important your foot is. And every step reminds you, oh, there's a neglected part of the body here that I can't live without, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 16. And if the ear says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would it make it any less a part of the body? Isn't it interesting how we always focus on the eyes? You know, when you, when you meet a a girl, you, you know, it's, she's got beautiful eyes. Um, and, and we talk about blue eyes and green eyes and brown eyes. And how many songs have been sung about a uh, girl's eyes, you know, brown-eyed girl and, you know, uh, my baby's got blue eyes, you know. You never hear any songs about ears, you know. 
She's got Betty Davis ears. You don't, you don't hear that. So it took me by com- complete surprise when my heart got lost in those big pink ears. We don't sing songs. I mean, that just doesn't work, does it? So that if you're an ear and you're thinking, man, I wish I was an eye. I'm not important. But when you can't hear, you realize how important ears really are. And I see people whose hearing is being lost over time and how hard it is for them and how they wrestle with, with every medical uh, treatment to try to regain some sense of hearing. But you know, there's another part of the ear that we sometimes neglect, and that is the ear is also responsible for maintaining our equilibrium. You know, I can't really, I don't know all the mechanisms that are involved in it, but there's some fluid back there somewhere in some little tube. And when that fluid gets out of whack, the whole thing just goes south. The reason I know that is several years ago, I had this horrific spell of vertigo. It had never happened to me before, and people have tried to explain it to me when they've had it before, and I didn't realize. I mean, your room starts spinning so fast that you can't even see anything. It just blurs the colors. And if you move your head at all, you're just horrifically nauseous. And, you know, I I wound up throwing up for about four hours before they finally called the emergency and uh, uh, the ambulance came and took me to the hospital. It was that bad. And the doctors explained to me that as you get older, there are little crystals that kind of float around in your, in your ear somewhere. And, um, and, it, and sometimes they get lodged. And when they do, it, it causes that fluid to get out of whack. And man, when that happens, you're in serious trouble. I, I have a friend that had a disease called Meniere's disease, which is affecting that equilibrium balance within the inner ear. And for, for two years, I mean, she just could barely even function. You ask her how important an ear is, and she'll tell you real quick. 1 Corinthians 12, 17, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If the whole body was an ear, how would you smell anything? So the idea is that we function together as a body, but individually we're only parts of that body. We're all different, but our uniqueness doesn't make us less important. Just the opposite. Every single one of us is essential. You see, I believe that God intentionally made me inadequate. I tell my wife that all the time. You know, I'm I'm like, baby, God designed me inadequate. He, He designed me to need you. Every single one of us are incomplete in some way, and so we need each other. Verse 19, how strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. I mean, think about what life would be if all you had were eyes and no hands. The eye could see what it wanted to pick up, but it didn't have a hand to pick it up. How frustrated would the eye be? Or what if the eye got something in it and it was irritating and the eye didn't have any hands to help get it out? And and so the point is very clear that each part of us is absolutely essential. Verse 22, in fact... Some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually most necessary. Man, we learned this with my oldest son, John William. When he was about three years old, he was staying over at a friend's house, and she was doing laundry in the living room, and she was folding the clothes, just putting them on the clothes hanger, and laying them across the back of the couch. And and little John William had been outside playing with with his friend, and, and he came in, his eyes hadn't fully adjusted, and he's walking with his head along the side of that couch, and one of those wire coat hangers hooks him in the eye. And I mean, went underneath his eyelid, in behind there, and just instinctively as a little kid, he grabbed it and pulled it out and straightened the coat hanger. By the time we heard about it, he was already in his first surgery. The doctors had told us that he had damaged all the stuff around his eye. Fortunately, he didn't damage the eyeball itself. But they were rebuilding the tear duct system. They were, they were cleaning things up, getting things fixed. And they told us, they said, look, we can't tell right now if he damaged the little muscle that raises and lowers the eyelid. Uh, we'll have to wait for the swelling to go down and we'll have to see if that eyelid works. There's a little muscle behind your eyelid called a levator palpebrae superioris. He said it's the size of a little tiny rubber band. But that's the thing that raises your eyelid. And if that gets torn, your eyelid can never raise again. And man, all of a sudden we realize the seriousness of a little part of the body that none of us had ever even heard of before. 
And sure enough, as his eyes, the swelling began to go down, that levator uh, palibre superioris muscle had been torn. And so we had to schedule another surgery. We went to an expert in Houston to get his eye repaired. And he said it's a very delicate surgery, especially on small children. And they were going to try to attach it. Another thing that we learned in the process was that if the eyelid stays down for very long at a child, John Williams' age at the time, that it would permanently damage his sight in that eye. And so we needed to get the eyelid up and we needed to get that working. And it was a delicate surgery. And I remember waiting in the waiting room. And, and in that moment, our whole world had kind of come down to one little rubber band sized muscle in the eyelid. That's all we cared about. And in that moment, I began to realize the importance of the body parts and those things that don't seem important, even those parts that we're not even aware of and how important they really are. You know, fortunately for us, the surgery went well and you can hardly even tell you know, what happened, or you'd have, to, you'd have to look at him closely to even be able to notice it. But thank, thank the Lord for tremendous surgeons and that God just led them in the right way to, to, to bring that healing in, to, to bear in his life. But man, what a reminder. We have all of these parts, and some of which we're not even aware of, that are so important in our lives and so important to the body of Christ that we have to really realize how much we need each other. I need you. You need me. Because every one of you is better at something than me. And this is especially true when we come back around to the, our understanding of what it takes to influence the world. We all have unique gifts. We all have unique relationships. And we all have unique influences. And so together, we have to use those things so that we influence the world um, and so every one of us has influence. That's the last thing. We're all different. We're all essential. And every one of us has influence. God has given everybody influence. You, you say, well, I'm not a very influential person. You are to someone. Because everybody's got influence. And you've got influence over some people in your life. You don't even realize how much influence you have. And so we've got to use the influence God has given us to help these people discover who Jesus Christ really is. And so we influence people by loving them. But you have to be careful here, okay? And this is where the church sometimes kind of goes off the rail because they become so focused in trying to influence people for Jesus that they feign love or pretend love or love somehow comes second to the influence. Look, you don't love someone in order to influence them. Don't love someone in order to influence them. You influence them because you love them. Love comes first. Love always goes first. Jesus didn't love people in order to reach them with the gospel. He reached them with the gospel because he loved them. Now that doesn't mean that you approve of everything that other person does. You can accept someone without approving of everything that they do. I can love you even when there's sin and there's bad stuff happening in your life. Um, and isn't that how Jesus loved us? Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act. He didn't wait for us to become good, you know, and he didn't approve of what we were doing, but he accepted us just as we were because his love drove him to that, okay? And, and look, Jesus didn't just come to the world to save the world. He came to the world to relate to us and to reveal the nature of the Father. And so to do that, he built relationships. And so while Jesus was here, he hung out with people, all people. Jesus even, even hung out with people that religious people had labeled notorious. Uh, uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and people that good religious church people shouldn't spend that much time with. Now, let's be clear. He hung out with them, but he didn't do what they did. You know, Jesus hung out with the tax collectors, but he never collected taxes. He accepted them, but he never approved of what they did. But here's the interesting thing to me. Jesus loved them enough to ruin his reputation. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but Jesus damaged his reputation by associating with these folks. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, he's still doing that because he damages his reputation by attaching it to me, too, because in those times where I blow it and I ruin my witness, 
I mean, Jesus' reputation gets trashed one more time. But here's the funny thing about it. He's not that concerned with his reputation. It's more about love because love always goes first. I mean, there were people who were saying all sorts of horrible things about Jesus because of the people he was associating with. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, And I, the Son of Man, f- feast and drink, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of the worst sort of sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by what results from it. Notice that little line. Wisdom is shown to be right by what results from it. Jesus didn't care what other people thought because he loved people. And whatever he went through in terms of having his reputation trashed was worth it because he was able to influence. Um, And they knew it. Here's another question people seldom ask. I mean, one of the questions they were always asking was, why was Jesus with those sinners? But here's a question nobody seemed to ask. Why were those sinners wanting to be with Jesus? And I'll tell you the answer. They wanted to be with Jesus because Jesus loved them. And they knew that he loved them. And people want to be around people who genuinely love them. So love always goes first. But it always brings the gospel along with it. The gospel always goes along. Transformation happened in the lives of the people that Jesus was hanging out with. Because Jesus was bringing the gospel with him. I mean, he didn't just talk about fishing and, you know, how long the beard was on that turkey or, you know, some truck and the tires it's got on. Or, I mean, they could talk about all those things, but that was never the only thing they talked about because he was always able to elevate that conversation and bring it back around to the kingdom of God and back around to the gospel and to challenge people about who they were and what their purpose was in their life and what their relationship with God was really all about. And as a result of that, lives were transformed. I mean, we we start with love. It all starts with love, but you bring the gospel along. And so you bring the gospel to bear in all of these relationships. Colossians 4, verse 5, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Here it is, verse 6, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now look, it's not forced and awkward. I'm not not trying to sell Amway, okay? And I'm not trying to win an argument about woke PC culture. I'm lovingly engaging my non-believing friends in a conversation to open their hearts to the gospel because I love them. Isn't that what love is? I love you and accept you just as you are, but I love you too much to leave you that way. And I know that the greatest gift you could ever receive is the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And so in our relationships, I'm going to love you enough to speak truth into that love. And so that's what we do. And then we're there when their world caves in because their world will cave in. Because a life without Jesus is always going to fall apart. And when that life begins to, to shudder under the earthquake that's going to happen beneath their feet, that's when they're going to be most open to who Jesus is. And that's when they're looking to you and that's where they want to hear about the difference in your life. And so all through your relationship, you sprinkle the salt of the gospel to season it. But I've got to tell you, we've got to do this together. Let's go back to Colossians 4, 6 one more time. And notice at the end of it, it says, everyone, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. That's the New Living Translation. But really, the actual word there means each person. Everyone is really each person. It's a little misleading because everyone seems to imply all people. But he's not saying that, generally, the crowd. He's talking about each individual so that you will be able to have the right response for each individual. You see that? Every unique person has a unique need. You are uniquely equipped to meet those needs in ways that I'm not. All of us are different. We serve different important functions within the body. Some are ears, some are eyes. Some people are attracted to ears. Some people are attracted to eyes. You love people that it's hard for me to love. I love people you might struggle to love. People love you that don't love me. People love me that probably won't love you. You have friendships I can't form. I have friendships you can't form. You have a reach and influence I don't have. You have relationships and connections I'll never have. And I have influence and relationships that you don't have. And together, we can do more than we could ever do by ourselves. 
And when we do that, people start to change. I mean, we see it in our church. In the past four or five weeks, we've seen over 50 people give their lives to Jesus. Just in the past four or five weeks. Last week, um, they brought a sheet in from the belonging area. Ten people had joined the church last week, three by baptism. I mean, people coming to Christ literally every week, sometimes almost every day. And it's not because, you know, Bill's this great orator. It's not because uh, Matt or Blake are, are, you know, singing down the stars. It's because you're influencing people in a unique way through the relationships that God has uniquely given to you. And we move with him. And we move together. We're better together because together we have influence. And when we use our influence for the kingdom of God, the world gets better too. Because when people get better, their world gets better. And so I want to call on you to use your influence. And I want to say this. If somebody's been influencing you, And they've shared with you. And you see in their life. You know what brought me to Jesus? It was the family of the girl that I was dating at the time. I saw in her family something that was missing in my life. And I said, that's the kind of family I want to be. That's the kind of family I want to have. And from that, I began to realize what God could do for my life. And people are looking at you that way. And you may be looking at someone that way, like I was. And you're like, you know, there's something missing in my life. And I know it. And somebody has seasoned our relationship with grace. And it's time for me to respond. If you've never responded, why don't you just do it right now, right where you are. You just say, Jesus, I'm going to give give you my life today. And everything's going to be different. So use me for your purposes. Hey, believer, will you use your influence? Will you work together with us? You know, the great thing about online church is you guys are online everywhere. And we've got influence in places we never had influence before. You don't even have to live in Louisiana. We've got some some folks who who watch from Arizona. And uh, use your influence. And together we're going to make a difference. Because this world needs to be different. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the power of the gospel. And for what you do in our lives. Help us to bring that same joy and that same power into our relationships so that we could influence people and we do it together. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you gave your heart to Jesus this morning, or if you need more information about what that means or any of those things, you can get in touch with the church. I think we've got the phone numbers and all of the, uh, the online stuff available. You can uh, uh, text in or message in to Wendy who who is our online campus pastor right now, and just talk to her. She'd love to help you in whatever way she can. God bless you guys. I'll see you next week.